Welcome back to another episode of Stories of MBL One. We have the incredible honor of having current Ringwood and Adelaide Lightning star Marina Whittle join us for this week's episode. Um, Marina, first off the bat, obviously, uh, I know it's been a very interesting time with an, an earthquake in Melbourne. Um, so I need to ask you, are you okay? I'm safe over here, mate. Didn't really feel it until I got onto the phone and had everyone calling me, checking if I was okay. But yeah, I just thought it was a train that went past extra loud. And then, um, yeah, looked at the news. People have fallen over, stumbling a little bit too much. We're okay. I'm fine. Yeah. That, that, that iconic Chapel Street sort of footage, it was like, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I did have to have a, not a laugh in it, and that sounds wrong, but I was like, you know, there's earthquakes seemed like a little bit and it was just like a few bricks and it was like world was coming to an end so it's been a very interesting 48 hours in in, in the state of victoria oh it definitely has my favorite part is that there was a news reporter live on the scene um, <laughs> i think yeah i'm getting reports the bricks took out a bench on the sidewalk <laughs> yeah, but we will rebuild <laughs> <laughs> love it off that I mean, how has it been? I mean, I'm unfortunate with the the season not ending the way that we, I guess, all were anticipating or wanting. I mean, how did you feel like you at least got something out of the season? Um, I mean, how, reflecting upon that now, a few weeks, how how's that been for yourself? Um, look, NBL One South. I think we were just so happy, happy and grateful to get any sort of season in. Um, it was a bit unfortunate not being able to play certain teams because that's kind of one thing that you look forward to and you always look forward to like certain road trips. Um, look, I'm really happy with my team's performance and how we came together and it was good to just get on the court, get into competition. Coming off WNBL and only playing basketball for two months of 2020 and then hoping to maybe get a season in NBL One South. Um, I'm really, really happy that we actually were able to play. It was pretty disappointing that we weren't able to finish it um, because you know when pieces start to come together at the right time and personally Ringwood, we were starting to look really, really good there leading into finals um, and we were really just chipping away. And I think most teams were starting to really come together at the right time and then, you know, we got hit by lockdown, COVID's hit again and got to stay safe really at the end of the day. Unfortunate, but yeah, we got to take care of people's health. Did you, coming into that with such uncertainty, did you have any goals or like what, what I mean, did you go, oh, look, I want to average this, do I want to make and, and finals? I mean, even when you came back for a moment, mm -hmm. like what, did you have to reevaluate what you were trying to actually get out of the season? It was more so, hey, just get the ball in my hands and, and doing something I love. Yeah, like let's feel comfortable with the ball. Um, in, do you mean the in between the lockdowns? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what, what yeah. were you trying to achieve throughout the whole NBL one season? For me personally, I was just aiming to get some really consistent numbers, getting some really consistent performance. Um, like I said, 2020 didn't even really exist, did it? So two months there, WNBL, especially coming from Victoria, being in a lockdown and then going to Adelaide and getting a really intense preseason. I don't feel like I got the best out of myself for the majority of the WNBL, especially because Adelaide went into their own little quarantine bubble while we were up there. Um, so definitely going into a longer season this year, my aim was just to get as consistent performance as possible and like to try and consistently push myself. Of course, I want to get game fit as quick as possible and maintaining that. So pushing for like sprinting for 40 minutes. I'm not a runner. I'll, I'll sprint for 40 minutes. And to sprint for 40 minutes. No, exactly how you feel. <laughs> yeah, but it was great. Like, and of course, like having a the off season it's so important to get with the girls and have a good community and good culture so that was probably the highlight as well let's yeah go to that you made the move from mighty knox raiders i mean to the <laughs> to now the the more fearful ringwood hawks i mean we'll what did you yeah uh, <laughs> i don't mind that um yeah. What was your most memorable, you know, um, feelings regarding that 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 move? I mean, what did you enjoy about making that like that that transfer? The transition. Oh, it was closer to home as well. Um, so it's good. Uh, it was good just coming back from like a really tumultuous WNBL season, wanting to play kind of near mum and make sure that mum can come visit and watch the games and stuff if she can. Obviously, Knox and Ringwood are not that far apart. Mm. Um, in the slightest, but it was just more of a culture and community thing. Ringwood, like Knox have an incredible community, 
um, surrounding them. They've got a great fan base, great group of people, great group of eggs. Um, but Ringwood was closer to home and I just felt um, it, it kind of fit my play style a little bit better personally. And I really liked the transition and I felt like green looked really good on me too. Selfish. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what matters. Look good, feel good. Absolutely. Great. The yeah. best mantra. Round one of the uh, NBL one season, you went against someone that you know very fondly. Oh my God. Um, and for those that don't know, your partner, Natalie Maley. Yeah. Now, obviously, one, how was the try and box her out? But the other side, I mean, how was that? I mean, weird, exciting. Oh, it's not uncommon for Anneli and I to play against each other. It was probably the worst game of the season for Ringwood. For both of us? Oh, for, for Ringwood, okay. No, Anneli played great. She knocked like three threes on our heads in the first quarter. It was amazing. Oh, and yeah, look, I tried to box her out because we end up playing against each other anyway. So, and when we train, we train against each other. And this is what we've been doing in lockdown. We're just training with each other, going against each other. So I know when to box her out. There's sometimes though that I'm just like, you know what? It's an effort thing. If you're going to run every time. <laughs> and then I'm going, my team's like, guys, just box her out. It's very hard. Yeah. Easier said than done. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you just box outs is an effort thing. And um, yeah, and running to rebounds is an effort thing. So it's really like on the day, who wants it more? So do, do unfortunately, you... Elton wanted it more that day. When you play against her, though, like say she hits three threes, you're sitting there going like, ah, it sucks. But then you're like, ah, good on her. Like, yeah. I'm stoked she's having a great game. Yeah. Oh, my God. First game, first play, they tipped it. It was the opening tip. They tipped it and someone got it on the side and then kicked it across the court to her wing three and just knocked down, like didn't even hesitate. And I was like, absolute good job. <laughs> I was like, yep. Okay, good. Yeah. So, yeah, it is a thing. It's like com I'm very competitive, but also I'm very supportive of her. So, as even in the hub as well, when she did so well, she had a, amazing rebounding games and amazing rebounding games in NBL1 and when she gets player of the week, it's amazing. Um and yeah, I just, I'm very supportive of her. But when we play against each other, it's all basketball. When will we see you guys playing alongside each other? Or is that a no no? Ooh, question was, of the yeah. year. Yeah, I've got a scoop. Yeah, here's a scoop. Um, I don't know. I, I think that's really possible. Um, I think we play really well together just off 3x3. Like we played a few tournaments together, um, went to the camps together, and we were normally on each other's teams. And I think we, play really really well together um just i guess it'll happen when it happens yeah, i'm hoping yeah. that it happens soon because i think we're a winning combination both on the court and off the court um for, an, for any WNBL coaches listening please there you go let us like know right. there you go. now yeah. speaking of WNBL, mm -hmm. you, you spoke it was a weird old season uh last year being in the hub and shortened season and in uh, you know interrupted throughout I mean, are you feeling like that's going to obviously help in the process of what this might look like? We still really don't know, but I mean, expectations show there's going to be some sort of bubble at some point. Um, hopefully not, but I mean, how are you approaching this? I know you're, you're obviously staying in good nick and, and trying to prepare, but more so, I um, mean, you're a huge mental health advocate. How are you preparing yourself for what could be, yeah, a lot of disruption again for the um, WNBL season? Yeah. Look, I think I took a lot away from last year. I think um, kind of getting swept up in the excitement of it all, but also there was kind of a rushed pace, especially for Adelaide. Um, we got up there, we played three games in Mackay or two games in Mackay, and then we went down to Townsville. And as soon as we landed, we had to go into quarantine for 10 days or seven days. And so like every other day we played a game. So within that, I didn't seem to find myself much time to, I wasn't, taking care of my mental health um, and I think that that could have been across the board and being in such an intense hub season it's so important to take care of yourself whether that's like five minutes to go get a coffee by yourself make some calls to home I don't think that I had any sort of communication as consistently with my family and my friends back in Victoria so you know if we do go into a hub situation and the season does get a little bit disrupted as well with WNBL um, I think for me personally, and I can only speak for myself and what I think works for me, um, and everyone is different with their mental health, but 
I need to keep my lines of communication open with my family and I need to keep those relationships active. I need to reach out if I need help with my family and I need to find those people within my team or within my staff or within my coaching group or even within the league if we are really close to other players who I'm comfortable with talking to and grabbing for five minutes to go stretch in front of the river or go get a coffee or go just sit on a lawn somewhere. So, yeah, I think hopefully it doesn't – Oh, you know, I actually don't think I'll be too mad if we do go into a hub because last year's prepared me so much. This year's prepared me so much. And, I yeah, I'm actually – I'm just excited to play a proper season. Mm. I'm excited to play a WNBL season. No, fantastic uh, frame of mind you got. Now, you're part of an absolutely fantastic initiative and, and commend you for that. Um, remember September. Can you, yeah, uh, explain it? You'll be the best to sort of give us, you know, what the what the, the whole initiative is about. What it's about. So it's been around since 2014 and it's been run by Pankind, which is the only um, charity or donation going specifically towards pancreatic cancer. So Pankind, the Australian Pancreatic Cancer Foundation. Um, 63 people unfortunately die every year, uh, every week, sorry. 63 people die per week. 10 people are actually diagnosed with pancreatic cancer per day. Um, for me, I found out about it before um, this started. One of my family friends, I have a very close knit family. Um, and she expressed to my mom and myself when we were sitting together that she's participating in the month of September. And I said, what's this about? And hearing the statistics about pancreatic cancer and hearing, um, yeah, like just those statistics initially was massive, but then also my family has been hit by it um, eight years ago. When I went to America for the first time for my first college year, my aunt was actually struggling and fighting pancreatic cancer. She fought for 18 months. Uh, and it just sucked. It, it was really hard to watch her because, you know, the spirit can fight so hard with your body, can't support it. it it's just unsustainable. So, um, yeah, it was really, really tough. And it's something that I even, I don't really talk about it that much because it is such a hard, hard cancer. And, you know, it's one of the type of cancers that you kind of pick up on really late. It's really hard to find early. And by the time you do find out about it, it's already it's already reached other parts of your body. So this is a massive, a, a massive deal for me and a massive deal for other Australians and just families because, sorry if I'm going on a rant. By no, the way. I don't. All good. But, you know, Pankind, they're just, the aim is just to make sure that people are aware of it, to get early detection testing happening, make sure that, um, sorry, and making sure that they can positively impact families and people who are affected by pancreatic cancer. No, thanks for sharing, mate. That's... It's incredible. With that, so the aim is to walk or run 63Ks throughout the month of September, which is obviously, you know, we're three weeks into it. I mean, what are you hoping to achieve? You know, obviously we speak about that. You're going to do that. Is it is fundraising is obviously the primary issue. Are you hoping to um, to continue advocating the importance long-term to, to highlight the importance or early detection, which obviously you just said it's difficult. Mm. I mean, what are you trying to um, personally um, I guess, elevate um, this, this unbelievable initiative? Well, personally, I would love to start advocating for it more. This was a bit of a hit for me. Um, I don't, I've never really talked about it. It's always been really hard. It's eight years on since my um, auntie passed. But being able to start the conversation, make people aware that this is such, it's the third biggest cancer in Australia. It's the third biggest, biggest wow. killer in Australia. So being able to start that conversation and, you know, wherever I end up next, just making sure that I can build these relationships within the community and making sure that we can get people aware of what it might look like, getting people into early, like detective, uh, early detection testing and, you know, just starting that conversation. If you're not aware of it, it's not even on your um mind at all why would you even consider that it might be an issue um and then on top of that i'd love to continue fundraising you know getting as much money into it as possible getting as much money into research and as much money to families that are in desperate need of help is very no, fantastic now and, and and say it's not if you're not comfortable in sharing at all but you're obviously in america for a significant part of time whilst your family member was sick and you spoke about those emotions um 
how tough it was. On the flip side, you were able to come home and, um, you know, can you speak about how grateful you were to, to be able to share those moments um, yeah. in those, yeah, in that low, sort of those last moments? Yeah, so um, a little bit of context is, you know, your first year of college, you always FaceTime on Zoom, ah, uh, Skype back in the day. So yeah. I'd always Skype her home. Where's Skype now? It's just like, That's a uh, great question. Right? So I'd always Skype home and um, I guess, uh, I think personally, I think people were trying to protect me from knowing what how bad the situation was. Um, and I left in August and, you know, every month the Skypes got a little bit longer and then it got to January and my auntie had really deteriorated. She was really skinny, um, couldn't really talk much. So I got the call from mum in March that it's time to come home and, you, you know, my my conference tournament was in March as well. So I spoke to my coaches and as soon as my conf as soon as my team was done, jumped on a plane the next day, got home on the Wednesday and saw my auntie on the Wednesday night, had dinner with her and then she was back in hospital on Friday and unfortunately um, unfortunately passed on the Saturday or Sunday. So yeah, it was really, really tough to be there, but, and I eventually stayed for a few more like for a few more weeks after it's just my family Ooh. oh I was, oh it's such what an amazing mate yeah but getting home and seeing her and, and being able to share that time with her as little as it was it was yeah I can't put words to it it was so I'm so grateful for it I'm perfect timing I have the I had have this saying my god I'm stuttering so bad um I have this saying that I think she was actually waiting to see me that's incredible. Um, yeah, the human body is amazing. The human spirit's amazing. So, yeah, I was really lucky and I was really fortunate to be able to get home when I did. And that's a credit to my mum, to my auntie, to my cousins. Everyone, oh, and everyone kept it a secret too. So as I walked in the door, my cousin saw me. She's like, what, Marina, what, what are you doing? And then I saw my auntie and she didn't actually recognise me at first. She was like, oh, my God. So, yeah, it was huge. And, that's yeah, awesome. I'm forever grateful for it. No, thanks for sharing that story. As, as difficult as that that may have been, but no, I really appreciate that, mate. With that, I mean, how can we help? How, you know, obviously it's social media posts, I mean, ourselves. I mean, and, and we'll put up um, a few links um, throughout this too. But I mean, if there is something, how can we help? Yeah, absolutely. So get on to Remember September. Of course, that's just like a one month in September sort of foundation fundraiser event. Um, mm -hmm. But if everyone can get onto Pankind, um, obviously do your own research, uh, book a test, make sure that you, you know, if you're feeling a little bit funky, you're also checking on your pancreas. Um, but if you have any donations and there's any way that, you know, teams, clubs, organizations can link up with these great, um, charities and these great foundations, please consider Pankind. Fantastic. Appreciate it. Now I want to finish on, uh, um, this last one and we we it's it's pretty obvious how passionate you are and um you love to give back um and you know for so i, I love your honesty you know as, as as much as people um you know they'll query it or whatever it may be and and that's just the world i love that you you are you wear your heart on your sleeve and um yeah it, it's it's really strong the lgbtqi plus community um and i do I'm not sure pioneer in that way in the WNBL. I think there's so much growth and I, I really do think you're, um, yeah, really, really um, helping deliver strong messages around that. Um, so again, I, I commend you on that. I mean, how inclusive has become, has Buckle, or even maybe I'm answering that for you. Are you seeing it becoming more inclusive? What can be done in that space? Um, what growth, what can be done? I mean, if there's some, re some real strong messages regarding that, um, how you see, how has this, you know, sort of um, the significant sort of topic um, benefiting your life? Yeah, so there's so much there, honestly. I can see it changing, even from when I first entered the league um, to now. And Adelaide does an incredible job as well. They have a, their own pride round. Um, and I talked with Lauren Jackson and... Um, Paul Maley and Mark Quinn and um, sorry other BA members yeah. to discuss how we can get a pride round happening within WNBL and I think I would hope that in the next few years we can get this happening 
Um, but, you know, it's all about creating an inclusive and safe space for people, you know, not necessarily, people don't need a label. Um, and I find that it's comfortable to have that so that people can feel comfortable and feel relatable and feel like there's a space for them, whatever that may be. So, you know, being, I'm currently living with Annalie and what she plays for Eltham. So seeing that Eltham has a pride flag um, at the front of the stadium, that's massive. And it's not, it doesn't mean to say that they're more important or that these lives are more important than others. It's just creating a safe space where people feel comfortable to just be themselves, um, which I think is massive. And, you know, I have noticed a change and I just find it so important that people feel comfortable to just enjoy who they are as a human being, whether they're on any, and any letter of that alphabet, you know? We're, we can all be ourselves at any time of the day and we should all be respected for that. We should all be treated equally. We should all, you know, be given our human rights regardless. So, yeah, I love it. I love where the world's going. I love where basketball is going especially. And I feel like we're just um, picking it up and taking it with us wherever we go. I don't think we can dismiss the simple notion of a flag because I think it is the importance, right? Like when, unfortunately... Um, racism, bullying, prejudice, discrimination still happens on a daily basis. I think something as small as that, which reassures, uh, reassures people that this community is inclusive, it's welcoming. Um, and sometimes we are still, as much as I, I wanna focus on the negative and, and we'll focus on the positive, but yeah, I think like something as, as what might seem simple as a flag does do wonders. I mean, what would your advice be to be, I'm pretty sure you were an ambassador for a basketball club, was it the first? Um, yeah, so it used to be Bush Rangers basketball, but now they're yeah. turned to Queer Alliance, um, yeah. Holding Alliance group. Yeah, yeah, awesome. But I mean, what, what would be your word of advice for either a club on how they can make their club more inclusive? Um, and it obviously starts from the top, but you know, if there was a club, even from a, a junior sport, you know, grassroots domestic club, to then the other aspect, an individual that may be a bit more apprehensive about taking up basketball, what those both sides, how would they go about that? You know, I just want to touch on how like important the flag is. And it's just a symbol of unity, right? It doesn't, it doesn't have to represent, you know, the LGBTQI, it also can represent straight people. It's just a rainbow. Everyone's represented on it, right? And it's not indicative of a place that you need to talk about it and express your sexuality if you're not comfortable. It's just, you know, it could do a world of difference for kids and for juniors and even for adults walking into a space and being like, hey, they care about me. Mm -hmm. I don't really have to talk about it with anyone, but just knowing that I can be here and I'm comfortable and people care and it's okay. So that's massive and just awesome. Um, so I would say, you know, it's not a big deal to make a statement or to, for clubs, for example, or for organizations um, and for people to just let it be known that this is a safe space. And especially with what's going on in the world, safe space is very seemingly hard to come by. So if you're not this, unfortunately you're that. And if we can just make sure that everyone's, you know, sending the positive right message of we are a safe space, we do welcome whoever walks through the door and you will be greeted with open arms. I think that's just gonna help us lead to change, some really positive change, whether it be in the LGBTQI space or whether it be in any other space, whether it be race, religion, types of people, abilities, sexuality, it can be anything. It just safe spaces is really the focal point of what my, is really my focal point. No, nah, perfectly said, mate. Mate, um, really want to appreciate your time and more so your vulnerability. Um, as tough as yeah. it is, you articulate it so well in, in terms of sharing your um, your stories and your passion for those um, people as well. Please look up, remember September, um, and please follow um, Marina on her Instagram in terms of to see her endeavours in that regard. But um, on behalf of all the guys at the NBL One here, we will obviously want to thank you, Marina, and wish you the best of luck for this upcoming uh, WNBL season and then your next year. Have you signed on with Ringwood or is that an ongoing thing? Can we get you some more money? I'm leaving it in the dark. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Love it. For everyone else, please tune in to, uh, to tune in for the next episode and listen to all on your favourite uh, streaming services, Apple, Spotify, or watch on YouTube. And everyone else, take care. And thank you again, Marina. Thanks, Greg. Have a good one.